another minute. Okay, our presentation is just about ready to get started. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Bray and I am the director of the National Park Service's Harpers Ferry Center for Media Services. Thank you for joining us for the fourth live event in our 50th anniversary celebration series. For those of you unfamiliar with who we are and what we do, the Harpers Ferry Center is the interpretive design center for the entire National Park Service. We get our name from our location in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. We are the hub for films as well as exhibits, maps, signs, waysides, brochures, museum collections, and conservation services. Today, we are excited to present a behind the scenes look at the history of the National Park Service's visual identity and explore what the future holds for managing this iconic brand. The presentation portion of this session is pre-recorded and following the presentation, there will be a live Q&A session with our panelists. We encourage you to enter questions and comments in the chat throughout the program. This event is being live captioned, so please turn on your captions within YouTube if you would like to view those. So I'd like to start by introducing our presenter today, Mr. Greg Aylesworth. Greg is a designer at the Harpers Ferry Center and is actively involved in brand management with the agency. He has over 25 years of communications experience with a specialization in brand identity strategy and design. Prior to joining the NPS, he was founder and principal creative of the consultancy OctaBlend, as well as serving as a senior designer and a brand leader for the Ohio State University Department of Athletics. So Greg, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Brendan, and thanks to all of you who have joined us here this afternoon. We're gonna take a look at a chronological overview of the National Park Service identity and then offer a bit of a glimpse into how it may evolve moving forward. So let's dive into it. One of the most recognizable elements of the National Park Service identity system is the park ranger in uniform. Visitors come to instantly recognize the flat hat, the badge, and the arrowhead patch. Other core building blocks of the Park Service identity are the arrowhead logo, two distinct moments in architectural advancement, and ultimately advancements in publication design, as well as cartographic symbols and maps and signs. With that as our baseline, Let's travel back in time to see where this all came from, why it is also very critical and equally fascinating. And it all begins with the US Army. The first hats and uniforms to grace national parks were worn by soldiers who helped manage the sites in the early years. The Army was called to serve in 1886 when it was deemed that the civilian administration at Yellowstone was not adequately protecting the park from vandals. As you can see here, by 1903, they were acting as guides too. That relationship understandably influenced what became today's ranger uniform. Early on, the only requirement was that all rangers within a given park be uniformed alike. Rangers continually tried to convince the bureaucracy to let them establish an identity, even at their own expense. They wanted to find a way to distinguish themselves like the Forest Service had already done with their uniform components. This explains why the 1910 U.S. Army uniform on the left 
became the model for the first uniform for National Park Rangers in 1911, seen to the right. The tactic was to distinguish the service by incorporating things such as a noticeable flat-brimmed hat. It worked. The flat hat has become synonymous with the National Park Service. The precursor to the stiff-brimmed hat was an alpine style, seen in this drawing submitted by manufacturer Sigmund Eisner. This particular hat on the left is similar to what rangers wear now, except it had a higher Montana peak. It's also called a lemon squeezer. Here we see a comparison between the higher peaked hat and the current Stetson style hat on the right. Both are considered campaign hats because their crowns are pinched in four corners. This Stetson style felt hat evolved from John B. Stetson's first Boss of the Plains, which he marketed in 1863. That offering has long been known as the Ranger hat no doubt from being used previously by the Texas Rangers and reinforced by National Park Service use. The current style of hat became a formal part of the uniform in 1920. The official color is Belgium Belly, which complemented the newly established uniform colors of green and gray. A side note here, the flat hat is responsible for a common misconception that Smokey Bear is a symbol of the National Park Service. This iconic Bruin does indeed wear a flat hat, but he belongs to our brothers and sisters at the U.S. Forest Service. The mistake is understandable considering the agency's shared history. Previously aligned, the parks and the forest reserves separated in 1905, with each eventually becoming their own agency. Prior to the establishment of the National Park Service in 1916, some park brochures were created by none other than the U.S. Army. As you might expect, they focused on wayfinding and rules. Enter the railroad companies that brought visitors to the parks. They began offering more colorful publications like these examples. Now, visitors could learn more about the parks as well as find their way around. In the 1920s, as use of the automobile grew, the Park Service recognized the need for maps, so they began producing visitor publications too. Their brochures included road maps and other detailed wayfinding information, as well as site-specific interpretation. At this point, in terms of a visual identity, we start to see the appearance of a uniform and brochures as a way to market the Park Service to visitors. But what about an actual logo? An uncredited mystery, the first logo appeared around the time the National Park Service was established in 1916. Featuring a sequoia cone, it was used sporadically until the mid-20th century, but never formally recognized as the agency's logo. Likewise, Western parks had been using a rustic architectural style that is sometimes called Parkitecture. The superintendent's residence at Crater Lake on the right is in this style. The entrance station at left at Mount Rainier is another example. But it was a service wide push in the Great Depression of the 1930s that made this architectural style part of National Park Service identity. Using Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal and Civilian Conservation Corps, Parks across the country were building entrance stations, lodging, visitor centers, and other infrastructure in the parkitecture style. The work is largely the legacy of architect Herbert Mayer, who worked as a consultant to the National Park Service during this period and later as an employee. He will play an important role later on. Despite an appeal that endures today, the rustic style of architecture was rapidly abandoned after World War II. The 1930s and 1940s also brought us classic women's uniforms that featured fatigue jackets paired with skirts and garrison style caps. We see sketches here as well as a picture of guides at Carlsbad Caverns National Park in 1937. The first official women's uniform was authorized 10 years later. 
One of the modifications made to the flat hat design in 1938 was adding three ventilation holes on each side, which are still present in the Park Service hat of today. This sign manual from the 1940s is the earliest we've found, although the National Park Service was using sign standards as early as 1926. Our publication's presence continued to grow stronger at this time as well. Here, we have the Shenandoah National Park brochure from 1941. Notice the logo. It's of the Department of the Interior. The Park Service is 24 years old at this point, but still doesn't have a specific trademark to represent itself like other government agencies. When people began flocking to national parks after World War II, it was clear the National Park Service needed a consistent identity. In 1949, NPS landscape architect Dudley Bayless won $50 in a service-wide contest for his design using NPS to form a mountain range. Shortly after the competition ended, National Park Service historian Aubrey Neesham casually discussed the winning logo with director Newton Drury, suggesting the service instead needed an emblem that expressed its primary function, like an arrowhead, or a tree, or a buffalo. He provided this sketch of an elongated arrowhead and pine tree, along with a note to Drury that said, in part, this may be the germ of an idea for an NPS emblem. A good artist may do something with it. And a good artist did do something with it. In 1951, new National Park Service director Conrad Worth turned this concept over to Herbert Mayer, the architect who made parkitecture an identity for the parks. Mayer was now assistant director of the Pacific West region. He and his staff brought Nisham's design to life. It was formally authorized by Secretary of the Interior Oscar L. Chapman on July 20th, 1951, placed into service beginning in 1952, and slightly revised in 1954, here to the right. What do all the components of the arrowhead mean? Although never officially spelled out, the logo's elements have consistently been recognized as symbolizing the many facets of the national park system. Sequoia tree and bison for vegetation and wildlife, mountains and water for scenery and recreation, and the arrowhead shape itself for history and archeology. span The arrowhead first appeared in 1952 as a plaque at a National Park Service conference and in the brochure for Oregon Caves National Monument. It began to be used as a patch on the uniform in 1955 and became mandatory soon thereafter. Finally, in March 1962, it was officially designated as the symbol of the National Park Service. It was registered with the U.S. Patent Office on February 9, 1965, and later given additional protection under the Trademark Act. Visitors began seeing the arrowhead on signs welcoming them to the parks. Some signs, like this, also used classic rustic elements such as massive timbers and native stone. National Park Service maps have oriented visitors to Yellowstone National Park's fabled beauty for more than a century. This map from 1957 depicts a clear visual hierarchy of roads, points of interest, and physical features. A monochromatic, hand-drawn, shaded relief softly highlights the park's topography. In the 1960s, fashion influences inspired new designs for the woman's uniform, this airline stewardess style of dress. The flat hat was still worn by male NPS employees. It had clearly taken hold. The arrowhead was a reality, and publications, maps, and signs were a growing part of the conversation. But the beloved rustic architectural style, which had spanned over a half century, took a shift toward the modern. The second period of intense service-wide construction began in 1955 to lead up to the service's 50th anniversary 
1966, an era known as Mission 66. During this era, more than $1 billion was dedicated to constructing 100 new visitor centers and thousands of administrative and service buildings, restrooms, and employee housing units. The period also saw a 40% increase in the number of parks. The style of the new architecture contrasted sharply with the rustic look that dominated the previous construction push in the 1930s. These new buildings, modern in form and material, referenced contemporary and commercial styles rather than the natural forms and finishes used by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Here we see Everglades Shark Valley Observation Tower on the left and the Grand Teton Visitor Center and Park Headquarters on the right. NPS began implementing more comprehensive sign regulations during this time period to meet new requirements of the Department of Transportation. The result? A more coordinated and robust presence, yet another step forward in National Park Service identity. Prior to the NPS sign program, parks could choose from a group of fonts, depending on the resource. One category was suggested for general use in parks, parkways, monuments, recreation areas, etc., having natural or scenic importance. Other typefaces were reserved for military parks and battlefields, while still others were more appropriate for historic sites. Modified Gothic alphabet number three, seen here, was frequently used in early signs. It was digitized into the typeface Shenandoah and closely resembles the WPA style lettering of the classic Park Service posters. It can still be seen at a handful of parks across the service, including, and not surprisingly, Shenandoah National Park. So the identity is heading places. Referencing our original baseline from the beginning, we have uniform components, signs, distinct architectural elements, an actual federal service mark, maps and symbols, informational and interpretive publications. And then the Park Service turned 50. Hold on to your flat hats. Influenced by the Mission 66 era of modern architecture, NPS unveiled a minimalist logo for an exhibit called Parkscape to celebrate the agency's 50th anniversary. Originally intended only for the exhibition, Park Service Director George B. Hartzog expanded the effort and pushed an initiative called Parkscape USA that included a plan to upgrade and modernize the image of the National Park Service. In a memo to the service on January 3, 1967, he announced that Parkscape USA consisted of three basic elements, a program, a name, a symbol. Designed by Chermayef and Geismar Associates, the firm that brought you memorable trademarks, such as the NBC Peacock and the PBS Heads, the logo had three triangles, which represented mountains and trees, encasing three circles that were meant to symbolize conservation. It was tied to a similar design for the Department of the Interior, and these marks were intended to phase out the NPS arrowhead and DOI buffalo seal outright by June 1, 1969. Recall that the final registration of the arrowhead as the NPS service mark had occurred only four years before in February 1965. Illustrations show how the new logo would look on a uniform cap and park vehicles. It was also on a U.S. Postal Service stamp commemorating the National Park Service's 50th anniversary. The logo also made its appearance on individual park promotional pieces, like these posters, leading up to the intended 1969 formal launch. The new complementary Department of the Interior logo on the right featured a stylized pair of hands holding a circle, sun, over two large triangles, mountains, which in turn were placed over nine smaller triangles that were meant to symbolize water. The NPS publications chief, Vince Gleason, had suggested the hands 
to symbolize that the nation's natural resources were in good hands. What became known as the triangles and cannonballs design was rejected by employees in the field, with criticism that included rangers would look like Trekkies. The Department of the Interior mark was met with equal disappointment, being described as a gosh awful mod monstrosity. This caused Interior Secretary Walter Hickel to promptly stop its implementation. In the 1970s, the National Park Service again turned to a renowned designer when Vince Gleason invited Massimo Vignelli to bring a fresh, identifiable look to park brochures. He was already well known for streamlined mid-century furnishings and simplified graphics for complicated systems such as the New York City subways. For the Park Service, he created the Unigrid system that is still in use today. He established standard templates to economize production and reduced paper waste while improving typography, design, and mapping. This strong systematic approach presents a strong visual identity without losing each park's distinctive qualities. Vignelli also introduced the black band. Here, we see early unigrids from the 1970s at the top, transitioning into those of the 1980s, which feature art or photographs and include the arrowhead. Inside the brochures, the map style is also evolving with brighter colors and standardized typography and symbology that we'll explore a bit later. There is so much to say about the Unigrid, but we're going to hold that for another presentation in a few weeks. At that time, we will explore more of the innovations Harper's Ferry Center brought to the world of communications. The early 1970s also brought changes to women's uniforms, like beige outfits with scarves and the option to wear fashionable boots. Volunteers wore sun orange pop-ons. They were available from 1970 through 1974 and fit right into an era that featured optimism and bright colors. Sign standards took another leap forward at this time. In 1975, Chermaff and Geismar Associates created new standards that introduced brown as the signature NPS sign color and Clarendon as the standard typeface. This firm also developed a set of pictographs for the National Park Service that were the basis for the symbols we have today. These are some of the actual slides used to create camera-ready art back in the day. The 1980s were a time of transition for wayside exhibits in the national parks. For those who may not be familiar with the term, wayside is the official park service name for the information structures dotting the landscape at your favorite sites. They're like little metal and ink rangers, readily at hand, offering interpretation and information to those who seek it. Now was their time to join signs and brochures as bearers of NPS identity. Having seen how Vignelli's Unigrid had transformed park brochures, designers at the NPS Harpers Ferry Center adapted the system for waysides. They added the black band and developed a grid system to design the content. The new design standards visually connected waysides with brochures, further cementing NPS identity for the public. The new design also visually linked the two most commonly used types of waysides, the low profile, which gives site-specific interpretation about features that visitors can readily see, and the upright, which typically informs visitors about an area or trail. Harpers Ferry Center has continually helped evolve wayside exhibit design and technology ever since. NPS maps had been developing their own identity elements since the 1970s. In addition to the now familiar pictographs, this 1987 map shows two new defining characteristics. The green fill and the boundary ribbon that distinguish the park from neighboring federal lands. What about that black border around the map? That was an experiment using X and Y axes like road maps. It went away but this map would go largely unchanged for the next 30 years. 
1987, NPS director William Penn Mott asked the NPS Denver Service Center to conduct a study evaluating signs in the national parks. They found a number of variations and recommended NPS have a central sign team to aid parks in design, procurement, installation, and evaluation of signs. Mott supported the idea saying, let us not revolutionize the National Park Service sign system, but rather evolutionize it to a higher standard and quality. At the time, NPS decided to train people in the field to manage the park signs. This made some sense because of the advances in desktop publishing and production technology that enabled many people to try their hand at designing signs and other media. However, the need for a central sign team remained. That brings us to the late 1990s and early 2000s. Next to the creation of Harpers Ferry Center itself and the development of the Unigrid brochure design system, one of the most influential additions to the National Park Service visual identity was communicating the National Park Service mission, also known as the Message Project. It established a national sign program as part of a clear communication strategy. Okay, everybody, sorry for the interruption. We are just gonna pause here for a moment because there seems to be a slight delay between the audio and our recording and the visuals and the slides. So in order to catch that back up, we are reloading the slides and we'll start right back up where uh, we paused it there. So just in a few seconds, if you can just stand by, we will start right back up. It shouldn't take long at all. This will help uh, as we get to the end of the slide presentation when some of our slides move more quickly. So. Thanks for bearing with us and we'll start back up shortly. There we go. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Minor technical difficulties. Well, I hope if you have comments or questions that you're entering them into the, um, into the chat box, and we'll be sure to get to those at the end. People to try their hand at designing signs and other media. However, the need for a central sign team remained. That brings us to the late 1990s and early 2000s. Next to the creation of Harpers Ferry Center itself and the development of the Unigrid brochure design system, one of the most influential additions to the National Park Service visual identity was communicating the National Park Service mission also known as the Message Project. It established a national sign program as part of a clear communication strategy, and it provided the field with a flood of new tools that accommodated advancements in print, web, and sign technology. This also led to clear management of the Arrowhead and put Harpers Ferry Center squarely in the lead of the National Park Service graphic design standards. As part of the message project, the National Park Service selected the Washington DC firm, Dennis Kanetska Design Group, to take on the task of rebuilding the Arrowhead. They had two major challenges. The Arrowhead's complex composition made it difficult to reproduce in small sizes and various media. And it was not clear to some observers that the logo was intended to be an Arrowhead. The new Arrowhead was formally released to the field in 2001. Visual communicators now had art that fit with new technology. The Message Project provided the first generation of digital publication templates for an array of commonly produced products. Each publication template came with all elements of the new National Park Service graphic design standards in place. 
Samples for each product type were made available to show effective use of grids and typography. The project's manual also provided detailed information for using the black band and how type was to interact with the arrowhead. Communicators were asked to think of the black band as part of the identity that also holds the other graphic elements together. Harpers Ferry Center also developed a hands-on training program to show park employees how to revise their publications using the message project and professional graphic design programs. This effort directly trained hundreds of people over two decades, and they in turn trained hundreds of other people. The program ended only when budgets cut training and travel. HFC continues to support field staff through online updated templates, technical advice, and discussions. As for signs, some parks continue to follow their own standards using a range of typefaces. This, and the fact that state and local governments began using brown to designate parks and similar attractions, meant that by the 1990s, National Park Service signs had lost some of the brand differentiation that they'd started with. To remedy this, in conjunction with the Message Project, NPS hired Meeker and Associates to create comprehensive sign standards. Using Yosemite National Park as a pilot project, Meeker created standards manuals for three categories of signs, park and facility identity, motorist guidance, and visitor information. The signs you see here are part of the third category, which includes signs relating to regulations, interpretation, resource protection, general information, safety, and pedestrian wayfinding. A major part of the work to develop new standards was the search for a typeface to replace Clarendon. The new typeface needed to have a distinctive but more contemporary look and be easier to read. Meeker chose type designer James Montalbano for the task. He created a handsome serif face that he named Rawlinson in honor of his father-in-law, who was, ironically, a colleague of Smokey Bear at the Forest Service. Eventually, Rawlinson was paired with Frutiger to give the NPS two distinctive and functional typefaces, and both were more legible than the previous typefaces. In 2001, Harpers Ferry Center implemented the NPS National Sign Program using the standards manuals developed by Meeker and Associates. The sign program designers provide a range of services from complete master plans to advising on individual signs. Here is an example of a drawing package they created for signs at Jewel Cave National Monument. It included a new park sign that merged the new typographic standards and modern design with local materials that showcased the nature of the park. This idea came from the sign program's manager, Bob Clark, who is now deputy director of HFC. In 2014, the National Park Service and the National Park Foundation started planning for the service's 100th anniversary in 2016. Developed by Gray Advertising, the NPS Centennial logo at left was created for use on Centennial-related materials and also merchandise opportunities for partners and cooperating associations. It was paired with the Find Your Park campaign logo, and the two marks were applied to a variety of materials. During this process, the National Park Foundation rebranded itself, shifting from its hat, mountain, stream logo to this new mark. Gray Advertising also created a complementary NPS mark that was used for specific Centennial applications. Its use beyond the Centennial was left open, perhaps for licensing, partner recognition, and to identify efforts associated with the NPS mission while protecting the NPS arrowhead. Some of the most recent Harpers Ferry Center advancements are in maps and waysides. The 2018 Yellowstone map was created entirely from GIS data. The shaded relief delineates meadows and forested areas derived from the National Land Cover data set to replicate the natural environment. With meadows clearly highlighted, visitors can identify areas to safely view wildlife from their vehicles or with spotting scopes. 
The map's terrain was generalized from high resolution elevation data to closely resemble its hand-drawn predecessors. The map is also geo-referenced, which allows visitors to navigate the park using their mobile device. NPS cartography continues to evolve with improvements in GIS technology and the availability of data while maintaining the artistic qualities of previous generations. As for waysides, Harpers Ferry Center recently designed a new ultra-low profile style for the United States Marine Corps War Memorial. Because they are much lower to the ground than more common waysides, they intrude less in this solemn place. They also include accessibility enhancements such as cane detectable bases and built-in solar audio description. Advancements are also being made in the uniforms. New embroidery methods have enabled the patch to more closely resemble the actual arrowhead graphic, allowing for it to be replicated in a more accurate and visually pleasing manner. The new design at the right, unveiled in spring 2020, allows for a truer arrowhead shape, better color contrast, and a much happier bison. The new uniform also features updated fabrics for better fit and function. Although NPS has had a presence on the internet since the 1990s, the onset of social media has presented one of the widest reaching communications touchpoints ever created. Our presence on multiple platforms is also part of our identity and so is our mobile app technology. Even with all these major accomplishments and hundreds of people trained to use the message project components, the NPS never had the resources to manage the identity effectively. So what do we do about this? We want to build on the success of the message project and its service-wide training. We want to turn this visual language, all these identity pieces, into something more powerful, a dynamic brand used service-wide and recognized internationally. NPS is already rising to the challenge. In 2018, Harpers Ferry Center coordinated with the offices of communications and partnerships to launch an internal audit of existing communications materials being used in the national parks. What have we discovered from this audit? We sent a request to all Park Service units and 250 responded, answering our questions and sending samples of publications. From those alone, we are getting a better understanding of the communications challenges facing park employees. In addition to developing visitor programs and activities, many of them have been asked to develop their park's publications and other communications pieces. Now the question is, how can we help? Field staff can find updated templates directly in the NP gallery on the internet and through links in various Park Service websites. They can ask us questions through the discussion groups of the employee-run common learning portal, and we are always available to answer questions by the more traditional email and phone. We also are exploring a larger service-wide idea formally establishing a nationwide community of practice, or what Harpers Ferry Center is affectionately calling brand ambassadors. This leverages the existing visual information specialist community across the service as champions of the Park Service brand. Many of these employees were trained during the message project and have served as advocates for NPS identity since then. Harpers Ferry Center would support them as they assist other Park Service units that do not have trained visual information specialists. The biggest group of stakeholders in all this are the people who work in National Park units and other NPS-associated programs. They are the people who are closest to the resource. We have to listen and react to what those stakeholders are saying. That is why we are actively soliciting feedback from the field and very much listening. Award-winning, effective, socially conscious, blisteringly creative branding is all based on the ability to listen, understand, and adapt. The great brands have always been flexible, even though they may not have broadcast or admitted it. 
We need to move our identity system into something that is rooted in the structure of a solid foundation, which the message project provided, but is agile enough to ebb and flow with the needs of individual parks and projects and with society. The National Park Service is a major brand and should act accordingly. In 2001, the renowned firm Ogilvy Public Relations identified the National Park Service as the largest, most comprehensive, and most efficient media and communications company in America, making direct contact with over 285 million consumers each year. More than Disney, more than Universal Studios, more than the National Football League. And today, we reach over 327 million people. We are a major brand. So what does this mean? We have terrific tools already. The arrowhead, the signs, the uniforms, the unigrid, basically anything we've been talking about this whole time. These are all used to form a perception that ultimately becomes our brand. But a brand is not these tools alone. What we have to realize is that whatever visitors feel, when they engage with the National Park Service, that's the brand, whether positive or negative. The brand is what they say it is. It is their gut feeling about your organization or product or service. Ultimately, perception is nearly impossible to control. What we can control is providing touch points, opportunities for as many positive interactions as possible with each visitor. We do this already through personal contact, from a maintenance worker chatting with visitors, to a seasonal interpreter answering a family's questions, to a law enforcement ranger helping someone who is lost. And we can reinforce these personal connections with professionally branded materials that are tailored to each NPS unit. These are touch points that afford us the chance to endear ourselves and our brand to our public. We have to be flexible, agile, and careful. A great way to frame perception is through emotional branding. With our particular product, we're lucky that we have the power of place, the cool rippling water of Merced River in Yosemite. And careful. A great way to frame perception is through emotional branding. With our particular product, we're lucky that we have the power of place, the cool rippling water of Merced River in Yosemite. An aromatic fragrance of the pines and junipers in Bryce Canyon. The sight of shimmering gold leafed engravings of the United States Marine Corps War Memorial or experiencing a film like The Way to Freedom, Selma, and the Making of a Movement, to in some way try to comprehend what true sacrifice and courage really mean. How we inspire people to want to share these experiences can be aided by a well-crafted brand identity system. We reinforce these emotions by creating another layer of connection through visuals and stories. It's not just about diversity. It's also about controversy, transparency, and honesty. What we're really trying to do is enable visitors to develop their own deep personal connection to our national parks that is far more powerful than memory alone. Former NPS director Fran Manila said, we are one organization with one mission. Each of us has a critical role to play in effectively communicating that mission to the public and extending to them an invitation to join us in our stewardship efforts. Once people connect to the brand and it registers in their hearts and minds, they will begin to truly understand it. And then the possibilities are endless. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, Greg, for that wonderful presentation. I'd like to now transition to our panel discussion and our Q&A session. So first, allow me to introduce our panelists. You all know Greg Ellsworth. Welcome back, Greg. And again, thanks for that presentation. Um, next up, we have Betsy Ehrlich. So Betsy is a publications pr production manager at HFC. She has many years of experience and has served in a variety of other roles at HFC, including as a designer for publications, exhibits, and waysides, and as an instructor for several courses in NPS publications and interpretive media, some of which you heard about during the presentation. Um, in each of these roles, Betsy has been involved with the development and implementation of NPS identity. So welcome, Betsy. Thanks, Brendan. All right, and finally, we have Phil Musselwhite. And Phil is retired from the NPS. He retired in 2017 after serving for 43 years in various capacities at HFC. He began as a staff, staff designer in publications and later moved to exhibits where he eventually became assistant division chief. Later, he served as chief of the division of Wayside Exhibits and the first manager of the NPS sign program. Phil, it's an honor to have you join us today. Thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to start off our discussion uh, with a question of my own, and then we'll jump into some questions that we received during the course of the presentation. Um, and this first question actually is for Greg, our presenter. And so we talked a little bit about brand ambassadors uh, as, as a look to the future of the MPS, MPS brand and, and brand identity and visual identity. Um, if someone is interested in becoming a brand ambassador, how do they go about getting involved? And can perhaps an NPS volunteer be a brand ambassador? And Greg, you're on mute, so. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Sorry, um, great question. Uh, while it's still under development, um, this is something that we heard from the field on. The respondents to the audit survey sort of pushed us in this direction saying, hey, we should probably take better advantage of these talented individuals that we have to help the entire service. And so um, we've targeted people that have already talked to us about this idea, but if anybody's interested, um, you can send an email to npsbrand at nps.gov and uh, we will just uh, take it from there. In terms of a volunteer being able to be a brand ambassador, yes, I think that's a distinct possibility. It all depends on uh, proper training from HFC and the skill level that's necessary to, to handle these tasks, but we are uh, open and willing to work with all. Great. So I have a question here um, from the audience, and this one is, is <laughs> I like the way this is worded. Um, so the black band is really annoying and takes up tons of ink. <laughs> Do we have to use it? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this one to Betsy to take care of. Well, it sounds like if you're talking about using up ink, we're talking about probably visitor use publications that represent the voice of the National Park Service. And, and in that, yes, you would use the full NPS identity. Um, that said, there are templates, uh, you saw them in one of Greg's slides with uh, the narrower black band at the top, doesn't use up so much ink, has the title and the arrowhead which sit outside the bar. Um, I mean, we use the NPS identity for the same reason rangers wear the uniform, which I understand can sometimes be uncomfortable. It's not for us, it's for the visitors. Um, yeah, just as there are reasons for some employees to work out of uniform, like you know, reenactors, um, there are cases when we might not use the full NPS identity. Interior visitor center exhibits are a good example. It would be really overkill to use the black band throughout exhibits. The agency identity really should be well established at the entrance to the building. So. Um, sort of the answer is it depends, but you know you want to put your media in uniform, and that requires use of the full NPS identity elements that Greg's presented. Great, thanks, Betsy. Sure. So another quick question here: um, Why didn't? So this is in reference to, I believe, the the choice of fonts and the creation of new fonts like Rawlinson. Um, why didn't they choose a different already made font? And I want to hand this one to Phil. Um, certainly could have. Um, I should say that typically brands are established typographically by two different typefaces, one a serif face, one a sans serif face. Um, Frutiger is the sans serif face, Rawlinson is the serif face. We chose Frutiger first 
chose it primarily because of its advantage on signs, which meant it was easy to read at a distance. And it is, in fact, one of the few typefaces that was designed specifically for signs. It was designed by Adrian Frutiger, hence its name for um, highway guide signs outside Charles Skull Airport. So it's an excellent sign face. Um, it also means, because it can be seen at a distance, it can also be seen in, in easily at, at very small sizes, so it's also a good publication spot. We wanted something that was would pair compatibly with Frutiger, so couldn't find anything, and so had a custom font designed. Um, the other advantage to doing that is that there was the theory, at least, and I'm not sure it's worked out quite so easily, the theory that if we were allowed to use the typeface by its creator, James Maltabano, we could restrict its use by other entities. Um, and I think to some extent that's played out, but I'm not sure if it's still active today. I think the typeface is more readily available than it, than it was initially. Wonderful. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. All right, a couple other questions to touch on here. Um, some good ones. So this one's for Greg again. If my unit does not have a visual information specialist or identity support, how do we get help? Yeah, again, that uh, NPS brand at nps.gov, you can just email us directly. You can um, use my personal email as well. We will try and get you some help. Please just uh, let us know and we will assess your situation and uh, get somebody to assist. I think we have a, uh, a slide with that email address for the NPS brand. I don't know if, uh, if we can pull that up while we're talking. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, we want to be able to offer help when it's needed. We just need people to ask the question, um, and, and we're here to answer. There it is. Thank you. Um, and I think you know this is something that we'll keep up for a couple of minutes uh, so folks can jot that down. And there are a variety of people that monitor that email address, so I think uh, we can handle a variety of questions, everything from sort of graphic type questions to typography type questions to even questions about, I believe, you know, partnerships and licensing and their use of, of um, visual elements. So another question, uh, this one for Betsy, I believe, and that is, is HFC going to be providing training again and new templates? Well, so, um, gosh, I, I really enjoyed doing the training when we were able to do that in class. Um, but the last formal in-training class we offered was in Acadia National Park in 2012. And unfortunately, since then, it's really been the tight budgets that make it difficult to hold in-person trainings. Um, we, haven't, we haven't developed a digital online version of that. Uh, I think um, one of the things we have worked on is the uh, alternatives, like the Common Learning Portal, which that was that wonderful new um, training portal. And so if you uh, haven't already, check out the Common Learning Portal. We've got a um, couple of different groups in there um, offer lots of information and links to things like the templates. And yes, the templates have been updated. Um, there's 22 new templates. They include uh, the things that were provided during the classes that were taught, but we've expanded that collection as well as requests come in. Um, and just remember, if you log into the Common Learning Portal or uh, get the link to those templates, which is on our website. Um, you have to be logged into the VPN because they're for NPS addresses only. Great. Thanks, Betsy. So we've got a couple of questions here that have, are trickling in. Um, I want to start with a few around this concept of, of the brand ambassador. And someone said that they missed it. And could you explain the brand ambassador thing again and what it involves? And related to that, another question about what the brand ambassadors do. So um, I can help you with this, Greg, but why don't you kick it off? Yeah, it's really uh, like we described, a community of practice. We have a robust and very talented group of visual information specialists around the country already. And one of the things that was clear from the audit was that a lot of parks don't have access to people like that, can't or don't want to, work on park produced materials themselves. And so how do we help them? How do we better help them? So the first sort of wave of this idea is tapping into the existing VIS community and basically um, trying to be able to help those units that, that just can't do this for themselves. Um, so Brendan, I guess if you wanna add to that. Sure, I mean, I think it's, it's an easy way to explain it is that it's a community of practice 
uh, made up, as Greg said, of existing visual information specialists. Uh, that's that's what we mean by VIS. And I think this is a this is something that's a concept that's still in its infancy. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of support for it through our conversations with the community that that we work with every day. Um, it's just a matter of creating the mechanism by which um, parks can connect um, and staff can connect and questions can be asked and then the support can be delivered. And one way to do that is through this kind of distributed network or this community of practice of people that have the experience, understand um, how to apply the MPS brand and then to deliver uh, answers and solutions when needed. Hey, Phil or Betsy, anything to add to that? Nope. I'm good. Yeah. All right. Okay, so here's a question that I'm going to open up to the panel. Um, need a volunteer on this one. So what are HFC's feelings about new, more welcoming, less authoritarian uniforms, especially for urban parks? Anyone want to try, try that one? I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's there, there has to be a conversation. Uh, I'll, yeah. I guess I'll step forward and say that there always has to be a conversation. Um, you know, HFC does not have a direct management of park uniforms, um, but we do work with that group often. And I think it's worth the conversation given everything in the world around us today. Um, I think we need to be looking for all opportunities and all um, contexts to have that dialogue. And certainly um, having that dialogue is the best place to start. Yeah, I will add that um the national brand management team, which is made up of folks at HFC, uh, Office of Policy, Office of Communications, and Office of Partnerships. Uh, one of the things, one of the talking points was a business casual line of uh, not necessarily uniform components, but some sort of an alternate gear that uh, people can wear for certain situations. So I know it is being discussed. Uh, so any input on that would be great. Yeah, I, I'm not in a position to speak for Harper's Ferry's opinion on this for sure. And, and anything I could offer would be simply my personal opinion. And it's it's a subject that I haven't thought about enough to offer anything that's close to an informed opinion about it. But interesting idea. Yeah. And I understand the compulsion for it, but I'm just not sure how I feel about it personally. All right. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. I think um, there's a couple other questions I'd like to jump to here from uh, from the audience. So here's one, and this is, again, I think this is a question for maybe Greg and Betsy that would be best to answer. So the question is for National Scenic Trails, is there a way that a trail segment manager who's not a National Park Service employee can have access to guidelines and resources for the creation of waysides on their lands? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and just say, you know, there are a lot of resources uh, available on our website. I mean, they've, as, as the website has evolved, those resources have moved around. So sometimes it might be a little hard to find them or hopefully it's easier to find them now. Um, but, you know, uh, other than the full brand identity, there are a lot of standards that we advocate uh, in terms of the media that we produce, things like legibility, plain language, um, visual uh, clarity, uh, hierarchy, focus. There are styles and approaches that are part of our NPS brand that aren't necessarily um, the visual identity components. Um, and those things we encourage others to use because they're just good for communication and they're not exclusive to us, but they are part of our identity. And so I think um, to the extent that you can find those sorts of resources, the editorial style guide, for example, on our website, we encourage that to be used. Great, thank you, Betsy. So it looks like you know we're running short on time. It's three o'clock now. I there's one more question that came through, and it has to do with um, the training that was so popular years ago, and that you know we mentioned in the in the um, in the presentation, and that Betsy also already talked about. And just some questions about the possibility of this training uh, being available in the future. And I will say that we are committed to finding a way to rebuild, um, you know, the training that's necessary and the knowledge base that's necessary to really uh, properly manage the brand across the park service, which with this decentralized network of 400 plus units um, and affiliated partners, that that's not a, you know, a small task, as we all know. So I think 
we also know though through the pandemic that we're you know, living through right now, there are remote opportunities here, remote tools available. Um, but the, the process now is to convert that kind of in-person in situ training into something that is uh, online. And we have the tools available, but you know, we need to have the, the demand from the field for that um, so we can begin to work on it in earnest. And I think the more we can get support from the field in doing that, um, the sooner we can get it out to you. So I want to know if there are any other comments or thoughts from our panel. It doesn't look like we have any other additional questions right now. Any other thoughts or last words? No, I, I want to thank you for including me. Um, and if, if you do this again, I'd be certainly happy to participate. Um, I'm gratified to know that identity is still a subject that's being talked about at HFC. I think it's an important one. Um, I'm not sure that everyone in the system understands the value of identity to an agency, to a public agency, but there are many who do understand that it's, it's value. And I'm, I'm glad to see that they are still at Harper's Fair and still working hard on this. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Greg, and thank you, Betsy, for participating with us again. I want to thank Greg one last time for an excellent presentation and for the panelists, Phil Musselwhite, Betsy Ehrlich, Greg Ellsworth, and I am Brendan Bray. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us, everybody. I hope this was helpful uh, and interesting and compelling for all of you. Um, and we do hope to do this again. Uh, there, there's so much more we can cover. And please uh, stay tuned for our Unigrid presentation, which will dive deeper into the Unigrid program. Uh, and Betsy will certainly be a part of that. So we look forward to that in a, in a few weeks. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.